Hello and welcome along to a very special episode of GG Weekend Watch. It's still kindly sponsored by Bet MGM, of course, but this is our grand national special with myself, Kate Tracy, in the hosting seat alongside the usual duo of Andrew Mount and Dave Young. So, of course, recording this on Thursday afternoon, the first day of Aintree is ongoing. So just excuse us if we're slightly distracted somewhat, but we're still getting the feel of the ground, of the fields, of the yard form as well then. But of course, all looking ahead to the biggest race of them all, the Grand National. So lads, we're going to kick on with the 120, a very competitive race as ever. A premier handicap hurdle for four-year-olds and over, over three miles and half a furlong at 120. Now, Five to on the field, headed by West Balboa for Team Skelton, who are chucking everything at these three days. They've got three in this. So, Dave, who wins the Saturday opener? Well, West Balboa obviously won this race last year, only down a pound from the start of this season. So not quite been the same plotty method they've done with Langadown. No ulcers for West Balboa, I don't think, this season. <laughs> but she has got some good form. Beginning of the season, she ran back at Aintree again, making it two from two. She was odds on 8 to 11, but she was well backed, was getting weight from brewing up a storm, obviously one at Fairy House. So kind of loosely that form has been Frank's, but they definitely will have been thinking about this race long, like a long way out. She was favourite for the long walk hurdle at Ascot. Can't remember exactly the excuses they used after, but I don't think she was really suited by uh, a grade one nature of that. And potentially even going the other way around, she might just be better left handed, but she was she was still sent off three to one favourite for, for a grade one. She's got an obvious chance, but obviously she has got an obvious chance. She's a five to one favourite for the race. So I know there's people that would like to um, just find winners. She might be one of those. One that I know you two would potentially want to talk about is Johnny Who. He, 136, he's still rated, right? He's got some reasonable enough form to suggest that he's as good as that, if not better. And I really don't think he likes Cheltenham. I think those last couple of runs, you can probably upgrade for the fact that it might just not be his type of track. Obviously dropping into a handicap this time round. Tiny, teeny question mark about whether he stays because obviously all his form is at two and a half. But if you go back to that shallow hurdle where he was staying on strongly, stayed on as strongly as the jukebox man did, and we saw how well he actually ran in the Albert Bartlett, Newbury would be much more of a similar track to Aintree in my mind. And I think Johnny, who's got an obvious chance, but he is coming in for a lot of support. At the time of recording, he's a top price nine to one. He was 12 to one when the declarations closed. He's as short as 11 to two at the moment. So then we're going to reach the point, aren't we, where you've got West Balboa with the plot one that's five to one. Johnny, who will probably be a five to one joint favorite and i've tipped up five to one joint favorites in a 20 plus runner handicap hopefully andrew's got something at a price for us right well if they go and win then no one will bat a single eyelid for that and each way plus race with bet mgm as well with six places on offer andrew were you i mean to be fair now you were shaking your head when dave said about johnny who beforehand so i'm guessing you're you're abandoning him yeah i think i uh, vowed never to back a john joe and neil trained runner again after that uh, lifeless performance in the um in the albert bar that was uh, very very disappointing um having been um, keen on him that day west bar barrister last year's winner of uh, six pounds high this time around but it's got the patient running style that has proved so effective in this race clearly goes well on sharp tracks who wins at Aintree, a win at kempton a win at warwick and if you look at her record unofficially soft or heavy going four runs two wins a second to stage star in the child hurdle back in 2021 and a runner-up effort at uh, sandown behind co qualicott so uh, yeah she's a sort of you know solid enough play spot inclusion if you want to back her each way at five to one i wouldn't put you off you probably get five places somewhere uh mon morale uh is another uh, one who fits the trends the winner of the per temps final at cheltenham last time out and uh, likely to be ridden patiently which is the tactic you generally need over three miles here at eight on, on the uh, on the hurdles track and, and the one uh, bigger price that uh, i gave a good mention to before the um, per temps was bold endeavor for uh, nikki henderson now of course when the henderson runners were you know generally running like hairy dogs um, bold endeavor uh, did run a cracker finishing placed uh, finishing fourth at 50 to one under daryl jacob in the per temps and of course uh, nikki henderson uh, had mill green placed in this race last year having placed in the per temps on his previous start. So although if you could choose the ground and the track for Bald and Devon, you'd go fast ground on a right-handed track, he will be wide if that's the better ground, which often is an entry when we're dealing with um, mud, then you know maybe he can uh, he can sneak into the frame again. So a son of fame and glory, an eight-year-old, could still be on the up. I'll go fame and glory each way. Fame and glory each way. <laughs> oh, sorry. <laughs> bold, bold endeavour each way. Bring that 
that would be quite something. To be fair now, we may as well have just gone back through all of the fame and glory zone in here. But yep, the eight-year-old statistic again then for fame and glory, for bold endeavour in here. I mean, to be fair, I would love to see fame and glory himself in this three-mile um, handicap hurdle. But uh, <laughs> it might be an interesting turn-up. Um, the one who interests me in here at 25 to 1 was Johnson's Blue. Now, he's sticking a lot of boxes for me in this one. No doubt he is likely racing for this season. Technically, the two runs. But, of course, one of those was his chasing debut on that penultimate start in mid-September at Kelso. Just a two-runner affair. He came up against an odds-on shot in that uh, match race. And he unseated then as well when he was probably beaten. Um, but last time out then, he came back hurdling at the end of February at Doncaster. And over a similar trip to this in testing enough conditions and won that despite being left in the lead. But I wouldn't say it was a completely cut and done thing that Bridge North was going to go on and extend his advantage at that stage. Because I think that Johnson's Blue was still fighting back all the same. And he ended up bolting up from Common Teddy in second in that, who's another uh, older fame and glory in that contest. So he's been given the five pound rise for it. Lightly race though this season. Good freshen up to hopefully avoid um, any sort of bounce from that solid reappearance run then. And yeah, Johnson's Blue then for me at 25 to 1 is probably the one that represented that bit of value and a bit overpriced. Right, the 155 up next, grade one action in the form of the Mersey Novices Hurdle for four-year-olds and over, over two mile four at 155. Now we've got the mayor, brighter days ahead, who heads the betting at two to one after obviously her very good second at Cheltenham, but most probably still felt it was a disappointing run given the regard that she's held in by all connections. So, Andrew, does she beat the boys this time or not? Very possibly. I mean, perhaps Golden Ace, the winner of that uh, Dawn run, didn't get the credit she deserved because we're going to see her at Aintree on Friday. And I, I quite like her chances uh, in that race. Um, so, um, you know, it could be a, a case of uh, Golden Ace franking the form before Brighter Days are headlines up here. But I'd rather go with um, the Nichols runner, Caldwell Potter, who, of course, has changed hands for €740,000 um, you know, since uh, winning in grade one company at Leopardstown over Christmas. Um, that was uh, two miles on heavy ground. You know, looking at the way he races, you'd, you know, the breeding, you'd expect the step up to two and a half to suit. And uh, they can get a slice of that back here, I think. So, yeah, I'll, I'll be with um, Caldwell Potter. I mean, the Caldwell Potter camp as well, like I say, a pretty penny. And they weren't even sure what they were going to get to aim at them for the remainder of this season. So I think you have to take it as a positive that all connections feel that Coldwell Potter is ready to do himself just this here. So, Dave, two votes for the expensive horse in here, Coldwell Potter. Where are you looking? Um, well, they're obvious, like, candidates, aren't they, at the front of it? But who else would know Caldwell Potter than Gordon Elliott? And Gordon Elliott sent in brighter days, brighter days ahead here instead of going for that honeysuckle mare's novice. Probably reading into something that's not there, but, I, I mean, he wouldn't run against him if he thought he was unbeatable, would he, surely? The interesting thing as well is they've both got the same mum, Matney. There's obviously Mighty Potter in the family as well, a few other good ones. So it's like brother and half-sister going against each other. It's quite a nice clash. So she probably knows him better than Gordon and Paul Nichols do as well. So who knows what will happen on the day. I just think the two of them, right, they're about two to one-ish, but maybe five to two Caldwell Potter at the moment. I can see them both being potentially, like, fancied. And they've obviously got chances. Caldwell Potter's grade, well, grade one win is the best form in it. But how good that's going to stand up over time, we just don't know yet. I'm a little worried about the fact that Nichols didn't send him to a Supreme because I think he probably would have gone quite close in that the way it's panned out. So we don't know what would have happened. And then obviously, if I think he could have gone well in a Supreme, I'm not 100% sure the step up to two mile four is exactly what he wants. But I talked about some of the family and they're like a mighty potter, like he should have no problem with the trip. So I'm lukewarm on him in the fact that I think they're priced probably a bit skinny as far as I'm concerned. And as much as I love Brighter Days Ahead, I can't forgive what she did at Cheltenham. Like she looked like she was going to be the winner. Jay DeGru, she ran under par and obviously came on one after. So brighter days ahead could do the same. But nah, I'm not forgiving it two to one, I'm afraid. The two that I am going to play against the field, right? I'm being very safe and secure on these first couple of races. But Jimmy Dassault and Il Atlantique, both running the Ballymore, both behind Ballyburn. And that horse is an absolute aeroplane. So as much as it was a two and a half miler or two mile five furlongs, they went real quick. They were both a bit outpaced on the turn in. Both of them prefer to be ridden on the front end as well. And both of them were hold up horses that day. They knew they couldn't get near Ballyburn. They were just there to pick up some of the pieces. Paul Townend sided with Jimmy DeSoy, which means, unfortunately, Patrick stays on it in Atlantic. I would have preferred Paul on him, to be honest with you. 
but you can get 11 to 2 Jimmy Desoy, you can get as high as 15 to 2 on it in Atlantic. So even if we just say for conversation sake they get backed because they're Willie Mullins, you could back the pair of them at 5 to 1 to, to represent 2 to 1 price. I'd rather to have both of them against it than pick either Brighter Days Ahead or Caldwell Potter at 2 to 1 themselves. So I think I think it's a good, good looking race, but I'm probably just playing a little bit safe, aren't I? No, to be fair, that's a good angle into this race with the Mullins pair then, Jimmy Desoy, who ran a mighty race, didn't he, at Cheltenham, out running 66 to 1, and Illet Lantik as well, who's honestly one of the best looking horses you'd see. A nervous kind of character, though. I always wonder if occasions will get to him down the line, but uh, a horse with an immense amount of talent, all the same. And yeah, Jimmy's just, Jimmy's a handful, but uh, yeah, he's again proven the ability that he has there. So that was the Mersey novices hurdle so again a bit of um disparity in our opinions in that one as we move on to the 230 next then and another premier handicap this time a handicap chase for five rolls and over over three mile one and another competitive betting heat to boot as well headed by Krabilly at four to one so dave who wins this one i think Krabilly wins it but i've got to say right well, i talked about johnny who in that first handicap um, I saw some stuff online. Someone shared it with me. In the last six seasons, I think it was, JP McManus is one from 66 in non-grade ones at the Aintree Festival. I think it runs at about 78% under expectation. So it may be a case that actually JP doesn't actually target handicappers at Cheltenham. But I look at Crabilly, right, and I forget about the ownership and just think there are so many years we have where a horse might just fluff his lines at Cheltenham and then they get redemption at Aintree. I thought Crabilly's jumping was probably the reason why he got beat, but obviously jumping's the name of the game. I'm not using it as an excuse. But the step up in trip should suit, although he's like damn sides, doesn't have it directly, like his closest siblings don't have the stamina so much in there in terms of the form book. His granddam did breed an Ida Chase winner. So I think the extra mileage will be fine. He stayed on in his point. I know that doesn't always mean they'll stay, but I think there's enough evidence to suggest the trip actually shouldn't be a problem. And with those few precarious jumps, if they're going a little bit slow in here, which they'll have to do to see out the trip, that might mean that he jumps a little bit better. And I do think even if he does make a few little mistakes, like he still managed to run second at Cheltenham, he's only three pounds higher. I thought he was well in then. I think his run shows that he's still got mileage to be better than a three pound hike. So he's four to one. It's another shortish price one that I'm putting up, but I think he's got a proper, proper chance. And it's key as well with entry fences. They don't really come up as thick and fast as some of the fences do at Cheltenham. Obviously it's a bit of a flatter track, so it might be easy for him to jump and i think there were 17 fences in the plate that you had to jump there's only two extra fences even though they're going an extra five furlongs so 19 fences for crabilly to get over if he scampers over them unscathed i think crabilly wins this gets redemption for cheltenham redemption for cheltenham i know that's something that i'll be saying all week to be honest with you but yeah crabilly probably one of the biggest ones then of those he certainly had his backers and did really well in the circumstances i thought with that second place finish as well three pound rise is going to be a little bit of a sting then for him on the back of that but four to one crabilly for dave andrew who did you like yeah tricky race i was half interested in last year's third third kinondo quetu for some england um, although it has been withdrawn, um, you know, more than once because of um, soft ground, including last time out. Uh, Caught and distance wouldn't have been off for 168 days, but goes well when fresh. So if it does dry out, if that, you know, we get no more rain and uh, strong winds for a couple of days, then uh, he could go well at a price. But I thought the safe each way play was Twig, around about seven to one for Ben Pauling. Um, Twig tends to disappoint in the depths of winter. He's got a fantastic record from March to early November. 12 runs, seven wins, five seconds. He found only Chianti Classico too good at uh, Cheltenham, the Ultima. And although you can argue that perhaps when he comes to the business end, he doesn't perhaps find as much under pressure as looks likely, you can't fault that consistency in the sort of spring, uh, early autumn uh, period. So it seems to go on any ground because that Ultima 28th one runner up having came on heavy going. So I would say twig each way. Uh, and certainly if you're playing the tote for effective, the banker twig to finish second perhaps and just put the field to win on, and the field to finish third, hope for outsiders uh, either side of him. Okay, they can, uh, again, a good way to play it then and a very unique way to play this race from a betting perspective as well. And it's just going to sound like I'm copying you twice in a row now because Coldwell Foster first and foremost. Now Twig then here as well because I thought he was the each way shot to nothing in this one as well. So about seven to one at the time of recording to hopefully back up that second from last time out. I was quite surprised how well he dealt with the ground there too. So I think he's proven his ground versatility as well as a result of that 
28 to 1 second in the ultimate behind Chianti Classico. Really solid effort from him, putting that Coral Gold Cup um, previous performance then to rest as well. So, yeah, Twig then also for me to defy that. Again, a bit of a sting of a rise for placing at the Cheltenham Festival, but you can understand why all the same. Right, the 305 now, the one before the big one. This is the Grade 1 Liverpool Hurdle. And this is a big one in itself, of course, as well. Four year odds and over. Over three miles and a half a furlong, as I say, at 3.05. So what a tee up for the Grand National this one is. Um, these bunch of characters, they're also now being joined by some top-level chasers as well. Monkfish and Hewitt, they're joining the party. So, Andrew, this race is just mad. Uh, what do we do with yeah. it? <laughs> yeah, I'm glad you said that because I've been really struggling with this and I can't really come up with a strong selection. I mean, Flooring Porter, we know he goes well so, so, so well left-handed and runner-up in the um, stairs hurdle last time. He'll be thereabouts again. So I de Berle, de Berle won this for the last two years and um, you know, still seems to have his have ability just by advancing years. He could go well. Crambo, you need to forgive that disappointing effort at Cheltenham. And, and Buddy One was uh, one of the ones I put up at Cheltenham at 50 to 1, he managed to get fourth. A lot of firms were playing four places. Leaves the impression he won, you know, again, a bit like Twig, he seems to be better in the sort of March to October period. And uh, I thought the ground had gone against him at Cheltenham, but he still ran an absolute belter. Uh, probably should have been third if he hadn't been on the inside of the track. So, uh, yeah, given maybe it's a time of year rather than a going thing, given that he's only a seven year old and still open to improvement, you know, I'll take uh, Buddy One each way against some of the old guard again. I every time I see this horse, I think of the time when you spoke about him after his win at Cheltenham in November, and you said if he goes to the Hatton's Grace and shows enough there, he might just be a lively outsider for the Sayers Hurdle. So I've had that in my brain ever since. Mm -hmm. That was justified with that fourth place. I, I can, only, can only apologise for putting things in your brain. Exactly. I, I know. To be fair, we spent far too much time together then for this uh, an hour a week. But uh, yeah, it's it's lodged in there now. Ten to one about Buddy One then in this one. No full on hope whatsoever. So Gino's, so Gino's looming up four to one on five to one six to one on in running seven to one on now. As he comes and claims his Will he? Surely he does. Of course he will. He's, he's one from there. Thirty three. Oh, hi, the Gino. Henderson form back. <laughs> Right, all of a sudden, there's going to be all on to Shishkin in the, in Shishkin. the bowl. Yeah, as as you're watching this, you will know exactly what's already happened in the bowl, but bear with us because it is still just getting towards half two then on Thursday afternoon as we record this. And Sergino bolts up over my left shoulder here. Dave, where are you on Sergino? Who wins the Liverpool hurdle? I, I was on Sergino. Unfortunately, I'm, I'm normally quite good with my entry points on horses and I got him wrong. I knew that people would be against him, but I can't believe he's gone off that price. I'm, I'm glad he's won. It's one of those that gets your monkey off your back, doesn't it, when you've got a bit of an opinion on a horse. And even with his preparation, he's gone and done it. Speaking of preparation, that actually leads me loosely into the Liverpool hurdle because like, I like the stairs hurdle division, whether it's novices or whether it's the open company. It is not the best in terms of what the ability are of horses that can potentially win this, or not always, right? There's been some absolute weldies over the years. We're in a little bit of a muddling patch. I was desperate to see Irish Point run in this race because I'd yeah. have had a strong, strong, strong fancy on him. The depth of this is really, really weak. So I know we know that Florin Porter does go well left, but twice he's hung and been beaten in this. And I don't think he's as good as he was those couple of years before. He's obviously still very good. 160 rated RPR in that second to Tiapu at Cheltenham. Side of Birdie, we've obviously touched on, but it's one of these, right? We've just got a field of, there's a few potentials in there. There's a load of what ifs, maybe, shouldn't be running here, probably should be chasing. We've got horses that are bled, horses that you've got, this is their second choice. Like it's a little bit of an afterthought for a lot of them. So the ones that have got to improve a bit, or the ones that have the potential, like a Crambo, I don't think I can forgive the Cheltenham run. Hidden Valley Lakes yet to be over this sort of trip, and he's sort of figures that he's posted up shouldn't really be good enough buddy one was very good at cheltenham but meh, i don't think he's good enough strong lead is a horse that i like he's a seven-year-old i think he does want this trip but i don't think he wants it on this test in the ground the one horse that's got to be the play in the race he's 12 to 1 now he was 20s when they revised the book he's 10 to 1 everywhere else i think this is going to be an absolute smash up i think monkfish will get another grade one win it's three years since he last won a grade one Paul Townend's always won on this horse once he got beat. That's when Cool Reevy won that novices chase at Punchestown and it came out after the uh, Monkfish, sorry, had had that setback. He'd had an issue and now he couldn't race for a period of time. But he came back in the Galmoy hurdle, albeit it was only beating Somerville Boy, but he was terribly weak in the market, ran really well. He put up an RPR of 160. So that's the same as Florin Porter got 
for coming second in the stairs hurdle proper. Now, they did run him in the Gold Cup. They had the choice of going to the stairs hurdle. Unfortunately, he did bleed in the Gold Cup. So that's always a concern when they're coming into this. But I think when you've got horses that are that bit older, like a dash with rash aside of early, that they're probably just over the hill now being 12 year olds. But they've proven last season and even a bit this season that they can still run at that age. Monkfish is only a 10 year old in the grand scheme of this race. It could be a veterans race. I think they decided at Cheltenham not to run him in the in the hurdle race, to run him in the Gold Cup, more for the sake of running him in the Gold Cup than anything else. And this was a, like a plan from a timeout. We've seen how Willie Munners likes to attack this meeting with some of his, I want to say, lesser lights, which is rude to say about Monkfish. We know how good he is. He is the best horse in the race. He's got that bit of form from this season. Last year when he ran in the spring, he didn't look the same horse, but he was going off nine to two for grade ones at Punchestown. This is the weakest grade one that he will have raced in in his entire career, including his novice days, I think. I think Monkfish at 12 to one is just going to be an absolute smash up. I reckon he goes off four or five to one, and I think Monkfish has got a proper chance. Loads of firms are doing four places on this race as well. Obviously, the bleeding is a slight worry, but if he comes back sound after... I don't see many finishing in front of Monkfish. That was what I was going to ask you, actually, because BetMGM are four places each way plus race here. Would you be trying to take advantage of that? Or with the bleeding, would you prefer just to back him win only? I'd be smashing him each way, I think. Obviously, the, the, the bleeding is a worry because you think they could potentially bomb out. But I, I don't think he should be a 12th one poke. I think a lot of people will look at this race and they'll struggle to be confident on a few selections in there. He's going to end up being the wise guy horse because he's the wrong price. So I, the fact that we're getting about twice the price, like I said, I think he should be a four or five to one poke. I'm happy to negate the loss of the each way terms. We're backing him each way because we get that safety blanket. I think he wins it, though. I think he does win. And as you both said there, Willie Mullins has gone off to a cracking start then for the Aintree Festival as well, from what we've been seeing over our shoulders also the 12 to 1 then about the fish cake, fish face, monkfish in here. <laughs> right. I know we will never be able to live that down. Henderson absolutely stitched this poor horse then all that time ago and forever he will be known as that. Uh, but hopefully he'll be known as a Liverpool hurdle winner as well. Now, of course, the big one itself the grand national of course the premier handicap chase seven year olds and over over four mile two at four o'clock now of course reduced field this year 34 runners no reserves last year's winner Korak rambler heads the betting in a bid to retain his crown at 11 to two fending off the irish challenges in the betting at least here but dave you get first go at the 2024 grand national how many, how many goes do I get? Because although they've reduced the field by six horses, I still think I need a good few stabs. Obviously, Karat's Rambler would be just, I think it's always just a good story, whoever wins the Grand National. There's always some sort of charm and bit that goes to it. But Karat, I, I like the fact that he went for the Gold Cup route. I like the fact that they haven't really messed about him. They've just let him run and just improve. Um, it seems a long time ago since he ran in that novice handicap chase here at the October, was it October meeting or November meeting a good few years back when he was rated like 120s odd, but we know how much he likes it here. I'm fearful for him though, because as much as Tiger Roll was able to come back and just be a different breed of horse in this, when Michael O'Leary wanted to prove a point and ran him in the bowl, he wasn't capable of running to a grade one standard, which to me would suggest that he wasn't necessarily a well handicapped horse in the Grand National. He was just a very good Grand National horse when he won it first time. Obviously being a stone light, it does help. I'm fearful for Karat Rambler that the weight is going to be the reason he gets beat. I don't think he is just excellent in this discipline. I think he's just a very, very good horse. So seems a bit mad to be poo-pooing a horse for being not too good, but being like a good horse. But he's five to one. I know there'll be plenty of thinking that you can have like a little each way on him as a safety bet. But yeah, I think there's better options in it. And especially when there are six places up for grabs with most bookmakers and there are some big, big juicy prices about there. So Kitty's Light sneaks in at the bottom, 34 that he's got in at. A very <coughs> obvious one. He was very obvious in the Scottish National last year and I didn't really want to bet him because I thought he was a too obvious one. Similar this time around, like I have bet Kitty's Light. I think he's got a chance, but 14 to one is very, very, very skinny to my mind considering he hasn't really done much this season, but again, it could be like a Langadan type plot, couldn't it? Limerick Lace is very interesting, but again, probably skinny. So the ones at bigger prices, because we want a big price Grand National winner, don't we? Let's shove in two, right? And I'm probably going to get poo-poo for both of these, but they are going to be 100 to 1. They're both 66 to 1 at the moment, but I'm pretty sure we'll get bigger, right? Mac Totty ticks loads of boxes on trends here. Stamina is a real worry, right? And obviously the ground is going to be slow, but if for some unknown reason he does really decide to stay... 66 to 1 is massive and he might just be one of those that's not guaranteed but 
more likely going to finish and could fill the frame. So he's 66 one at the moment. I think we'll get bigger because people will like not like the ground, not like his stamina. So Mac Totty goes in there. And a previous Kim Muir winner, Shambard, goes in. 66 to 1 again at the moment. I think you'll probably get close to 100s at some point. We know this horse does actually stay. The ground's fine. And again, ticks loads of boxes in terms of what you would want from a Grand National profile. So there are lots towards the front that are possibly like well fancied and well fancied for a reason. But you think about it, right? Karach Rambler, I am Maximus, Meat of the Waters, Vanillier, Mr. Incredible, Kitty's Light, Panda Boy, even Limerick Lace. They all have like reasonable logical cases to make, but you can't have all eight of them winning it. So I'll take two big swings. We'll go for Shambard, Mac Totty, each way, play them in a forecast as well. Why not? In a forecast, goodness me, we'll never see Dave ever again. If these two, if this forecast of a 66 to 1 pair of Mac Tossie and Shambard goes in, but yeah, this this was nice knowing you anyway, Dave. But um, yeah, like you say, we'll probably get 100 to 1 on the day for, for either one or both of those two then as we come towards it. And again, each way plus race, six places on offer with Bet MGM here. Right, Andrew, that's teed up nicely for you. You get a couple of stabs as well, but we expect no less than 66 to 1 now. Uh, yeah, I won't be going quite into that price bracket. This race is a completely different animal since they modified the fences in 2015, made it more of a long distance hurdle race. And uh, interestingly, in that time, the younger horses have come to the fore. Um, 139 horses aged 10 or older have contested this race since uh, 2015. All 139 were beaten, which is a bit of a worry for back as a core rush rambler. You know, it's a horse I love. I put him up each way in the Gold Cup. He's a spring horse. Um, he, he could he could win this, but you know you were getting ten, twelve to one last year. You're getting half those odds this time, so uh, I'm not too worried about you know him winning without my money on at the price. I am Maximus is a complete enigma. He jumps out to his left on right-handed tracks, so you think, well, he's going to improve when he goes left-handed. He doesn't. He jumps terribly, spends too long in the air, and bombs out. He's had four runs at right-handed Fairy House, three wins and a short head second. He hasn't won away from Fairy House since um, 2021, so I can't have him at single figure prices is absolute madness uh, meeting of the waters is the one of the, uh, the shorter price ones that i like um he's only a seven-year-old but so was noble yates when he won this a few years ago previously it was unheard of wasn't it for a seven-year-old who'd only had sort of six or seven runs over fences to win but it's a different beast now we're talking about easier fences uh, we're talking about younger classy horses coming to the floor you know remember 2015 oh you can't win with more than 11 stone what happens money cloud carries 11 stone five since then tiger roll 11 five so all these old stats People are sort of like throwing stats at you based on the 80s, the 90s, the early 2000s. Ignore anything that happened before 2015. It's a completely different race. Um, Vanillier, last year's second, you, you can make a case for. Uh, but the, the other one, as well as meeting in the water, I like is Kitty's Light, who tends to come to hand in the spring. And because won the Scottish National, the Bet 365 Gold Cup last year. And uh, you know, regardless of the obvious story attached to it, because of the struggles Christian Williams' and his family have had this year, um, I, I think, again, and his jumping them, that sort of style of, you know, um, I'm, I'm, I'm not going to make a fool of myself by making the shape that horses who, um, you know, <laughs> jump over natural fences make nowadays. But do, do you remember, uh, um, what was the uh, Jessica Harrington horse who finished second at it was it Magic of Light a couple Magic, of years ago? Yeah, no. Basically, like, walked through the, the second last fence, I think it was. And that's what you can do nowadays. It's almost as, you know, they're almost as flimsy as Doncaster's fences in places uh -huh. now. So, uh, you know, the shape Kitty's light makes over his fences would have, you know, made me put a line through him, his natural chances sort of 10, 20 years ago. Not anymore. Uh -huh. uh, but he's sneaked into the bottom of the weights. So I think he's got a fantastic chance. So, yeah, meeting the waters and Kitty's light for me. Kitty's Light is at 14s, Meeting of the Waters 9 to 1. Good ride then for Danny Mullins to pick up because it was interesting with Mark Walsh, the fact he's gone with Limerick Lace here. I'm pretty sure Paul Tannen was always going to ride Iron Maximus and get the first call of him, but interesting that he's gone Limerick Lace rather than Meeting of the Waters. But I'm pleased you said that about Kitty's Light all the same because I narrowed it down to five initially. Uh, Glenn Gooley as the number one selection, Kitty's Light for second in, Panda Boy, Chemical Energy and Gallia Della Toe then in here. And for all that, Jack Tudor's going to have to sit tight on Kitty's light because he's got his own way of jumping. He tends to go through the top of fences rather than, like, say, going over them. I'm doing it now. We're going to have our own little Grand National dance <laughs> going on with this. But, um, yeah, uh, I 
expect him to save a trip, which I'm not entirely sold on for Glenn Gooley, but it's 66 to 1. I'm going to join Dave in with the big prizes here. I thought that he was not one to underestimate. Big ride then for Michael O'Sullivan in here as well. And of course, we talk about William Mullins handicap chases time and time again, but I think he's got a much better chance than his price suggests. But as I say, the stamina though, hopefully that question was answered to a large extent with his second in the Tiestes chase on that penultimate start where you thought, well, he's clearly answered any sort of stamina doubts there, which he had going into that race. By the way that he battled back in the race in the home straight, he's a former point winner. So for all that he was pulled up in his only ever try over three miles as a novice, it looked to unlock so many doors for him at Gorham Park. So it's interesting. He came back to two mile four at Cheltenham for the plate, but that's something that hopefully is just going to sharpen him up. And we've seen it before with national winners in recent years, prepping over two and a half miles. He's by coastal path that he's produced for likes of Assyrian Falange, Franco de Port, Bacardi's, who all became uh, stayers then for Willie Mullins in time and some of his best um, stayers then as well. So Glenn Gooley, the main play, but I've chucked four other names into the mix in case any of them win, then we can clip this up and I can claim at least one of those. But that was... Yeah, the go, go, just uh, on the subject of chemical energy, he's got a fantastic mm -hmm. record at this time of year, so the March to early autumn, six wins from 13 starts. The only thing I was worried about slightly was the going, whether it would be too soft for him. So, uh, but you know, maybe he'll end up being a bit like Twig and Buddy One. It's the, the time of year, a bit of sun is back rather than the, the ground that's important to him. So yeah, yeah, so yeah. 40 to one or 50 to one, certainly won't put you off. 40s for him. We haven't seen him for a while, but of course he is uh, another one of these horses that potentially this has been now the long-term aim for him in his new colours as well, picked up by Bective Stud from the Coldwell Construction Dispersal Sale. I would say that's a story. I don't necessarily know if that's going to be a great story for the Grand National, but it remains to be seen. I won't be crying if he goes and wins at 40 to 1. All the same. Right. Anything from anywhere else, lads? We've had the five races at Aintree to cover, which we've been able to go into in depth, which was really nice to do so andrew i'll go back to you please anything from anywhere else yeah, i did look at the 10 a.m at chelmsford but uh to class it is too difficult <laughs> too difficult well we can forgive that one to be fair um because i i doubt too many people will really notice uh dave anything from anywhere else yeah, there's only two more races at Aintree, so I'll be quick, but I'm going to go through the card, right? The five o'clock, founder 50, will win the Mag Hall Novices Chase. I like the fact that they've kept the horse at two miles. Hercule de Sul for Willie Mullins hasn't been seen since October. Does worry me, I think there'll be market support for him, but I think founder 50, especially with that Elite Tomps form boost from today, will absolutely mop up. So I'll be scared a little bit of Matata back on a flatter track, but... Founder 50 is a strong bet in the five o'clock. And in the last race, the bumper had the winner last year in it, Florida Dreams. That's the main reason I want to cover the race, just to blow my own <laughs> trumpet. But I do fancy Mashan 2 this year for Emma Lavelle. Currently top prize 10 to 1 at the time of recording, as low as 7 to 1 in some places. I suspect this horse will be fancied. First four places up for grabs. I think that horse will beat Mr. Meggett. So the last two winners at entry for you, just for good measure after the forecast in the national. <laughs> after after the 66 to one then for between the well four of a pair of them then in, in a forecast goes in in the national uh dave will still be sticking around for a 10 to 1 bumper winner as well such is the courtesy that he has for the race uh right then lads nap time so dave hopefully one of the 66 to one shots now for the nap but what's you gonna your uh your nap's gonna be for saturday yeah, I mean, I don't want to be too too bullish and go for the 661 pokes. I'll go okay. for um, Crabilly in the three mile one handicap chase. That Cheltenham redemption is coming. Crabilly's still a very well handicapped horse. Perfect. The 230, I believe that was, let's say, the uh, staying premier handicap chase then. Andrew, your nap. Well, you've caught me out by asking me this question. Um, I'll go <laughs> buddy one in the, uh, in the stairs out on the 305. It's the standard prefix now for that question. Um, and I will go Caldwell Possa then. I'm buoyed by Andrew's confidence as well in the Mersey novices heard on. Hopefully that pretty price tag that he costs will be well founded and justified. But that is everything from us on this very special episode of GG Weekend Watch. So a big thank to Andrew and today for all of their hard work as per usual. A big thank to our sponsors, BetMGM. And even bigger thank you to you at home for watching. Best of luck with your bets this weekend and enjoy the 2024 Grand National.